And in the King James, it'll say Lucifer. It doesn't say Lucifer. It's all nonsense. Caller, you're, you're live on the air. Please tell us name what, uh, and where you're calling from. Hello, William and Rabbi Singer. This is Rachel from Pennsylvania. Um, I have a question about this so-called end-time epic battle that everybody's waiting to see all of the chariots and angels flying out of the sky to have a war with Satan. So I'm noticing that in Ezekiel 28, verse 16, Isaiah 14 and 12, and in the book of Revelations 12, 7 through 9, is where they're getting this big, um, you know, build up to create this character for this war for the end times of Satan and uh, the most high creator of the universe. So I was wondering if you could, Rabbi Singer, please explain what Ezekiel 28 really is about, Isaiah 14 really is about. Shalom, and uh, I appreciate all that you guys do, and have a blessed day. Excellent. Very good. God hates arrogance. It's really that simple. In fact, um, those of you who attended my lecture in Jerusalem last week on Isaiah chapter 10, we spent a lot of time on that because the prophets detested haughtiness. And in particular, the hoardiness of not only our enemies, but our friends as well. And that's what comes into view in Isaiah chapter 14 and in Ezekiel chapter 28. Let's explore those together. Let's first talk about this war of Armageddon. There is no such thing. <laughs> So the War of Armageddon comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 16, and it's based on a complete misreading of Zechariah chapter 12. Let's lay this all out. We are told in Scripture explicitly that at the end of days, nations will go to war against Israel over Jerusalem. It's really that simple. You'll find that, for example, in Zechariah chapter 8, huge chapter 12, and it stretches all the way to the very end of the book of Zechariah, meaning Zechariah chapter 14. It is famously in Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. All these chapters work together in symphony, and there are many others, but these are the most famous. Now, Nations will want to attack the Jewish people who have returned to the land of Israel before the Messiah comes. This is very important to get this all lined up, and then we can talk about how every, all the Christians get themselves into trouble with Isaiah 14. The Jewish people return to the land of Israel before the Messiah comes. Nations then attack Israel, attack Jerusalem. It's an ill-advised adventure. They'll all be destroyed. Jerusalem will be a heavy, burdensome stone to all the nations who come up against it. Zechariah chapter 12. God will strengthen the weakest of the Jewish people. They will be like David, even like the angel of the Lord of hosts. They will defeat their enemies. Now, in the midst of that battle, battle there will be a person killed in war, and that will cause the nation to weep, to mourn over him. And the, the Navi says, the prophet Zechariah says, that the mourning over him will be like what happened in the valley of Megiddo. Now, Zechariah is referring back to the last of the great Davidic kings, Yeshiyahu Josiah. Josiah got killed in the valley of Megiddo when he went to war with Egypt. When the nation got wind that their beloved king died so young, so tragic, they mourned for him. They mourned terribly for him. And it triggered a repentance. That's the key. So 
what Zechariah chapter 12 is telling us, and this is a device that prophets use very frequently, is if you want to know what this future event is going to be like, meaning in the midst of a battle between the Jews and somebody great gets killed and that triggers mourning, you remember what happened to in the Valley of Megiddo. Whoever wrote the book of Revelation misconstrues this all and calls it the War of Armageddon based on that. It's a complete, complete misreading. Moreover, there is no such thing as an antichrist. It's all made up. And there is such a thing as Satan. And thankfully, Satan appears in Tanakh very infrequently. I'm going to say that one more time. It is very rare for Tanakh to make any mention of Satan. Now, why do I say thankfully? It's not for the reason you think. I'm grateful that Satan doesn't appear much in Tanakh. This is a little counterintuitive because it makes it easy for us to know who he is. Who is this Satan character? So Satan does whatever God wants him to do. He is an angel that has no free will. He does whatever God wants. His job, his mandate, is to seduce people away from God and then to accuse them. That's it. That's what he's created for. He has no free will. Angels cannot go to war against God. That's not possible. Now, that is very possible in the pagan world. Very possible. It's very possible in the dualistic world. And this is the same stuff that fuels Paul, that uh, fuels Manichaeism, Gnosticism. It's the same avoidazara, same idolatry in all of them. So let's get back to our case right now. Listen carefully. In Ezekiel chapter 28, the one who is in view is who appears in verse 1 and 2. It's Hiram, the king of Tyre. I implore you, when you have a question about the Bible, look it up. You just look it up for yourself. But I grant you that if you look up a passage in a book like Ezekiel or Isaiah, and it's out of context, you'll have no clue what's going on because these prophets very frequently, most of the time, are using imagery to describe something very simple. So if it's out of context, all the trouble in the world. Hiram, a king who was a benevolent friend of the state of Israel in the ancient world, best friends, a financial giant. Think of it very carefully. A financial giant mercantile and supplied Israel with the best woods from Lebanon, supplies for building the temple. But the king of Tyre became arrogant, demanded cities in the land of Israel. And cities that were offered him were just not good enough for him. He had all the potential in the world, and he destroyed it. And as Ezekiel 28 opens up, you're just a man. That's how it actually begins. So I, I plead with people to look it up for themselves. Isaiah chapter 14 is a, a portent, a prophecy of doom for Babylon. Isaiah was writing 20, roughly 2,700 years ago. More germane, Isaiah was speaking, preaching during the Assyrian Empire. And he was looking into the future to the Babylonian Empire, which didn't exist yet. It would be like someone 200 years ago speaking about the Soviet Union. Isaiah describes the fall of the king of Babylon. Please read Isaiah chapter 14, but in context. So if you go to Isaiah 14 verse 4 as an example, you'll see it's speaking about the fall of Babylon, not Satan. Satan is not mentioned anywhere in these texts, nowhere. Christians have to come up with this stuff and interpolate it. 
See Babylon mentioned again in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 22. What's going on in this one passage in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, where the King James actually renders, Ech nofalta mishomayim helel ben shachar. Look how you have fallen from heaven. And in the King James, it'll say Lucifer. It doesn't say Lucifer. It's all nonsense. King James just put the word Lucifer in there, which is a, a reference to Satan. Lucifer really is the planet Venus because it's the word Lucifer. Where does that come from? It's, Lucifer is never mentioned in any Bible. It's not mentioned in the Tanakh and the Hebrew Bible, and Lucifer is not even mentioned in the Christian Bible. Never, never mentioned. What, what the heck is Lucifer? How did that name for the planet Venus came to come to be the name for Satan. So it's not in the text. And I say to this, my friends, you know, if you if you didn't love God, if you didn't love Hashem, you wouldn't be watching the show. You have to why are you watching this? Because you want to see my blue shirt. You don't need that. You have other things to do with your life. If you're watching this broadcast, that means you love Hashem very much and you understand you want to understand his word. Isn't that marvelous? You have the creator of the heavens and the earth giving you a message. Wouldn't you want to read it in the words it was given? Why read it through translations? You're reading the Bible with it, using a translation is like kissing God through a towel. You lose everything. What's Halil ben Shachar? That means the morning star. What does that mean? Why is this a image of Bavel, of the Babylonian king? Listen very carefully. Today, we live in a time when the art of understanding the stars has been lost. Most people look up at the sky at night <laughs> and they see nothing. Why? Because we live in cities for the most part. So there's so much light pollution, we can't see anything anyway. But even if we could, we don't need the stars any longer. Why? We, if you want to know what time it is, you want to know what direction you're going in, we have all sorts of instruments. We have clocks, watches, cell phones, compasses is fairly old technology. We have it all. We don't, there's, we don't need that. But in the ancient world, that's what they had. A, a clock, a watch, that's a relatively modern innovation. Now, if, if it's daylight right now and you look up at the sky, why don't you see the stars? Why don't you see the moon? The reason it's not, is not because it's not there. It really is there. But you can't see it. Why? Because of the sun, because there's just too much light. At night, you could see the stars and other heavenly bodies only because it's dark enough to see it. The sun is out of the way, and then the sky is dark, and then you could see all the heavenly bodies. What is the brightest heaven celestial body in the heavens? It's the planet Venus. Therefore, listen very carefully, Kindleach. The planet Venus, because it's the brightest celestial body, as the morning approaches, the planet Venus is the last celestial body to be visible. So as the morning is coming, right, so all the stars begin to disappear, which they're there, but our ability to see them is lost. The last celestial body that's still visible is the planet Venus, and hence is the brilliant metaphor of Isaiah. The kings of Babylon, they were very proud. Could you imagine? You know what the Babylonian Empire was? The Babylonian Empire? Do you know what that was? You know what that meant? The Babylonian Empire in its time? People thought it would never disappear. It could never be destroyed. Look how powerful how strong. Nebuchadnezzar? Do you know what that meant, the Babylonian Empire? And that's how the empire portrayed itself as eternal. So Isaiah compares the Babylonian king, the empire, to the planet Venus. The planet Venus, in a sense, 
the Halal Ben Shachar, in a sense, it, the Morning Star is arrogant. It's not really arrogant. It's, it's gorgeous use of language. The planet Venus, in a sense, goes, look at me. I know the sun is coming up. I know it's sunrise, but I'm still here and I'm never going away. What happens a few minutes later, the sun continues to rise, and from our perspective, and then Venus disappears, gone. That's it. That's where the word Lucifer, as in lucent, comes from. So Isaiah chapter 14 is talking about Bavel, about the fall of Babylon. There's no mention of Satan. The idea of, I know someone's going to ask me about Armelius. Don't ask me about these things. It's silly. That at the end of days, there will be, a, will be nations that will go to war against the children of Israel, against Jerusalem. They'll be destroyed. They are not the Antichrist. The Antichrist means, that's found, the Antichrist is found explicitly by name in the Epistle of John, in the Epistles of, in the Epistles of John, in Revelation, in Second Thessalonians. It's there. The Antichrist is a pretender to be a Messiah. All that's nonsense. Is an Antichrist, meaning an anti-Messiah figure who most Christians believe will emerge, and then the, then the Jews will worship him, and it turns out he's really Satan. This is all nonsense. When Mashiach comes, everyone will know there's no anti-Messiah. Armelius, I know, only because I know someone's going to come up with this, Armelius is a unambiguous reference to Romulus. Who's Romulus? He's the mythical founder of Rome. That's all it is. Rome is the last empire of the four empires that subjugated the Jewish people. Edom, Rome, is the worst of all. And Edom is going to be destroyed. We have entire books in Tanakh devoted to the destruction of Edom. It's finished. It's gone. No more. And that's where – so there will be nations. Hopefully much of this has happened already, meaning that nations have come up against Yerushalayim. The Jews are here. God strengthened the Jewish people. Ezekiel chapter 28 is about Hiram. The key is that both Bovel and Hiram – Two very different types of figures, one of them an enemy, one of them an ally, but both become arrogant and God destroys, destroys them all. And Mashiach then comes and please God, we will see the coming of the true Mashiach, Bimheda Biomenu. Thank you for that thoughtful question. <laughs> יציר נברא ואת נעשה בחף צוקו אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נועה והוא היה והוא עובר, והוא עובר, והוא 